Good morning, Julia. Um, you've written uh, a very long, you've written, you've written quite a long, lot of long Twitter threads, 24 parts read this morning about uh, concerns about, well, a booster jabs plan. So much of the success of uh, us getting out of if and when lockdown will be down to the rollout of the vaccine, which has been very successful. But there's a lot of talk about booster vaccines in the autumn, particularly for the most vulnerable. But as so as far as right, we are now, we don't have a plan for who's getting those jabs, where they're getting those jabs, when they're getting those jabs or what jabs they're getting. And that's a little bit of a concern for you. Well, would you mind, Julia, if I just started by just saying uh, what a fantastic achievement the NHS has done over the last six months in terms of doing the vaccinations that we've done? I mean, the, the words world class is as you and I know, have been banded around rather a lot over the last 15 months. I think genuinely, if you look what's been achieved, 60 million uh, doses administered. If you look, we went from, you know, just administering one vaccine in about 200 sites. We're now administering four across thousands of sites. And we've done it at real, real pace. And we're in a bit of a sprint phase at the moment, as you know, because we're very keen to kind of ensure that on July the 19th, we can remove those social restrictions. So um, I think it has been an achievement. But what we're really keen to do is carry on with that achievement and what we now need to do is really start looking forward get ahead of the virus get ahead of uh, the problems that it causes and for us that basically means ensuring that uh, we can uh, as i suspect we will need to for probably i don't know 5 10 15 years uh, basically ensure that we can vaccinate the population year in year out against covid-19 and to do that this autumn we do need to think quite carefully about how for example are we or are we going to combine COVID-19 jabs with flu jabs, yeah. that would make a huge difference at the front line. Are we going to vaccinate children or not? And then we also then need to kind of answer some questions around, you know, how long does the protection for these uh, from these first jabs last? We know it's six months since uh, we had the first ones done. And we also know we need to answer questions like, should we be mixing and matching? So I've had double AstraZeneca. Uh, if I am going to have a booster jab in the autumn, should it be uh, another AstraZeneca? Should it be a yeah. Pfizer? Should it be a Moderna? So these are really big questions. But since the flu jab campaign starts in September, we really do need the answers to this kind of quite quickly. And we're we're going to move almost to... seamlessly from the rollout of the jabs to all over 18s and say the children's jabs is another issue yet to be decided. Um, but you think we're going, to, we're going to have to move almost seamlessly into those boosters. But we don't know yet whether people do need boosters. There's a concern for particularly older people, the people who, of course, first had their jabs, that they will have had a longer period, you know, from December, January onwards. But and, and also the concern that they don't have a strong immune system and so don't have the same sort of boost effect from the first two jabs anyway. But, but I mean, this would be the NHS going in, in full mode for rolling out jabs and then remaining in full on mode for the for the boosters as well. Well, that, that, that's precisely the point we're making, Julia, is that we don't know the answers to these questions at this point. And in terms of we do need to answer them exactly as you say, how long does that protection last? Uh, should we be mixing and matching? How do we um, how frequently do we need to tweak the vaccine? So, for example, at the moment, you know, we know that we tweak the uh, flu jab annually. But we know the big issue here is the um, is the you know, if we get new variants. So we know that for this particular combination of variants, the vaccines do offer for incredibly high levels of protection. And that's that's confirmed. Whenever you speak to any hospital chief executive and you say to them, so who have you got coming in at the moment from COVID-19? What they say to you really clearly is very, very few uh, people who've had double jabs. Yeah. But we know that new vaccines, particularly since we've got this uh, virus effectively running, really ripping in places like, you know, uh, Brazil and India. And we know that however hard we try, and you know, Australia is a great example of this, however hard we try and have very, very tough times borders the answer is that these variants do seem to kind of uh, arrive and they, so, they, exactly and they did arrive in australia but the, the, this is the thing though isn't it it's like there is going to be a trade-off and and you've been you, know, you and i have clashed in the past on, on issues of lockdown and restrictions but i'm detecting a a change in your mood on this based i think on as many people have felt on the vaccine rollout, which is we've got these brilliant vaccines. We know they work. We know they work against even the variants of concern, maybe a tiny bit less, but they work. They're all we've got. And there is now, as you know, this huge backlog of cases, 5.1 million officially on the NHS waiting list. You know as well as I do in your position as NHS providers and Matt Hancock hinted at it at the NHS Confederation Conference last week. Actually, you're closer to 12 million when you're looking at people. People haven't even been referred. GPs are literally being told, 
you, you can't refer anybody. The waiting lists are full, basically. And there are people who've never even gone to the GP who may have serious illnesses like cancer uh, who will die as a result of these long waits. Um, you know that there are other priorities now weighing up. Um, do you think that we should have extended lockdown? Do you think that that is helping the NHS? Will that help overall health, overall levels of death in this country? So there's a lot in that question, Julia. So, um, yes, you and I did have a disagreement in January because at that point we could see there were likely to be, you know, th there were 34,000 people uh, with COVID-19 in, in hospital because we hadn't got that far with the vaccination campaign. Thanks to the vaccination campaign, as you and I both know, there are only 1,200 people currently in, uh, in hospital um, at the moment with COVID-19, despite the fact that those infection rates are rising uh, in community infection rates are rising fairly rapidly. So, you know, the vaccines have made a difference. And there's that great phrase, isn't there? The evidence has changed. So and the data's changed. So surprise, surprise, I um, have changed in terms oh, yes. of being more, being more willing to kind of consider uh, the fact that, you know, the trade off um, between, uh, you know, um, 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 these freedoms uh, and, and uh, removing these social restrictions uh, has actually changed as a result of the vaccines. In terms of your question about lockdown, um, I, 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 we said at the time that we thought the Prime Minister had a really difficult kind of balance to strike, but you could see that the emphasis that he and the government were, were, were placing was really on the fact that if we delayed by four weeks, we would be able to uh, vaccinate significantly more people. And you will have seen those queues outside yep. my football stadium, because I'm a West Ham fan, outside you know the West Ham ground, outside the Tottenham Hotspur ground. We have mm. thousands, tens yep. of thousands of people who we were able to vaccinate this weekend. And, and Julia, don't forget, it's not just about people who come into hospital and die. There was a really interesting study in America last week, which showed two million people's health records uh, had been looked at. And 23% of people who'd had COVID-19 had within a month some other form of um, health problems. So there's emerging... Oh, but, no, but, but the thing but, is, oh, but, oh, no, no, no. When there are comparative studies of people who haven't had COVID, you often see the same sort of statistics statistics as well. Yeah, and all I'm saying, Julia, is that, you know, and I'm not, you know, as, as, as you've noted, uh, we are doing everything we can in the NHS to are try you? and ensure that on July the 19th, we are able are to... You, uh, now they, this, is that the case? Because, I mean, we talked to David Davis a little bit earlier, um, the former Brexit secretary, and he voted against the lockdown extension. And he was asking about, you know, Nightingales. Uh, we didn't use the Nightingale hospitals uh, last time round uh, in, 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 the, in the spring last year. They weren't needed, effectively. Only a handful of patients got transferred. Um, and they weren't used in the winter because they'd already been dismantled. A lot of people are saying, like, you know, we've even got, you know, Susan Hopkins, the deputy chief medical officer, uh, saying yesterday that uh, that actually, you know, it's, we, we may face further lockdowns in the autumn and winter because of pressure on the NHS. We'll be told, I've no doubt at all, we'll be told the NHS can't cope. It's overwhelmed. We need to lock down. Uh, to prevent. Now, A, there's no evidence that lockdowns actually prevent deaths. So but we, that's, you know, I know I disagree on this. The, but B, the crucial thing here is. Why don't we just boost NHS capacity? The, NH the Nightingale hospitals were built. There was all the, the equipment in there. We were told since they weren't the staff. We also know there are thousands of people who were perfectly well qualified, who volunteered to return to the NHS, who were rebuffed, who, who, would not, who weren't able to jump through the various hoops, who could have been working in those hospitals. Why don't we prepare the NHS right now so that no one ever has to have their freedom restricted ever again? Well, so the, your basic point about the fact that there is a really important question to debate here about how much NHS capacity we need is absolutely spot on. And, and you know, we know before we went into lockdown, the NHS was really struggling because it had a demand capacity mismatch. I mean, we, we had some of the lowest uh, and, um, you know, least happy, as it were, figures in terms of on both uh, accident and emergency uh, waiting times and on elective waiting times, precisely because we've been through this 10 year period mm. where we simply did didn't grow the capacity to meet the demand. And, and, and Julia, the whole point about this is that, you know, and, and I know it's a subject that is going to be difficult, but we are going to have to learn to live with COVID for a period of time. And one of the ways in which we're going to have to learn to live with it is we will need the ability for hospitals to be able to quickly ramp up their capacity and then ramp it back down again. And as exactly as you said, we need to be able to cope with those surges in COVID patients just at the point when we're getting through that waiting list. Yeah. And the problem at the moment is that every time we have a COVID surge, we have to dial back on the elective recovery because we don't have enough capacity. So, Julia, I, I'm very happy to join in with you to say 
to the government, let's have a debate about what hospital capacity we need going forward. Well, let's we keep that going forward. We'll have to leave it here. I'm way over time, but I hope you'll come on again very soon and we'll discuss in more detail about what we need to do to make sure that happens. That should be our number one priority, if you ask me.